tons of other questions on climate change and maybe on some recent developments in U.S. politics. Um, but we, before we ask you to, uh, before we invite you, the audience, to to, uh, to ask more questions, we would like to first give a more general overview of, uh, of your career mm -hmm. and the different positions you've had. So we're going to ask some questions on different, uh, those different positions. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, when I was a young student, uh, undergraduate, um, graduate student, I just wanted to do, well, math and physics and then physics. And I loved the subject. Uh, so I wasn't trying to achieve anything in particular, uh, I love doing physics. Um, as Joel often said, I also, when I was growing up, worked with my hands a lot, and I discovered I would go in the lab and do play experiments, and finally I went to my thesis advisor and said, I'd rather do experiments, so he said, okay, I can, you can do experiments. And so we started doing experiments together. Um, so I had no real in those days, the most fundamental science experiments were what I was brought to, up to focus on. And so for my PhD thesis and postdoc, I was, there's a new theory that had just come out in the late 60s, and I was a graduate student in 70, 76. Um, and it was a theory that unified electromagnetic theory, electricity, magnetism, electrodynamics with the theory of weak interactions that talked about uh, beta radioactive decay um, and nuclear forces. And just like electricity and magnetism were unified, this theory said that it's all one and the same type of force. And, and by the early 1970s, uh, in large part due to two people, Veltman and Tuft, which who showed theoretically that some of the theoretical problems in, in that theory could be solved. So these were theoretical theory problems, self-consistency problems. And, and once that happened, a lot of people in this early 70s, people took it very seriously. We took it very seriously. We saw it before it was just a flaky theory. But, uh, and then it was shown uh, to be upheld by that experiment, numerous other experiments, is now called the standard model. So, um, so I started in that area. I went and did other fundamental physics tests of electrodynamics, things like that, even when I was at Bell Laboratories. And then in the early 1980s, I started talking with some people who had dreamed uh, more than a decade ago can use light to hold on to atoms. And the management had shut it down by then. It, it, they were, were thinking about it for 10 years. And the last, um, and then three or four years before I was introduced to this, they said, no, you're not making enough progress. Go find something else to do. And they shut it down. And so I got to Homedale. I was a department head. And I said, well, then sort of a different approach to it. I told my then director, um, who had shut it down. So he kind of looked at me and said, OK, you made a lot of other things work that we didn't think were going to work. We'll let you do this, but don't try to talk anyone else into <laughs> helping. So I said, all right. So was, um, my postdoc and my technician and I started on this project. And after made very rapid progress, and after about nine months, I said, Psst, it's going to work. Come on, boy. <laughs> and, uh, and it did work. In, in a year, it worked. Uh, uh, less, almost less than a year, uh, we did op what's called optical molasses, laser cooling. But I've done other things at Bell Laboratories as well as that. And then when I got to Stanford, you know, making fountain clocks, better time, atom interferometers, playing part, bringing back together, using wave nature, holding on to molecules with light came out of that. And so when I started this work in 1983, I had no idea. I knew about clocks, and that's the only thing I knew about. I had no idea about atom interferometry, about uh, optical tweezers and molecules. Uh, but then after we got it to work, all of a sudden these ideas started coming, and we showed that they all work. But since that time, that was good, and I was going more and more into biology. By 2000, I was more than 50% in biophysics biology. 
But about 2000, I started, as a citizen, started reading about climate change and energy and thinking, you know, maybe there's some truth there. And, and, and then I would stick on the back of my talks on physics or biology or biophysics 10 or 15 minutes of maybe we should pay attention to this climate stuff, but they may be right. And, um, and then in 2004, I was asked by Lawrence Berkeley Lab whether I consider being uh, the new director. Uh, the old director was my former boss at Bell Laboratories, Chuck Shank. <laughs> it's a very small world. Uh, Chuck called me and said, we'd like you to apply. And I said, I'm Chuck, I'm not really interested. I'm happy doing my research here. They asked again. Even people at Stanford said, you would be very good at this. You should do this. And finally, I said, how can I be talking about climate change? And I could be head of a national laboratory. This is a big lab. Its budget was a, a half a billion dollars a year. Unlike a director of a university, the director of the national lab has a lot of budget control. <laughs> and um, not as much the Department of Energy slowly wants to take it back. But, but even in those days, and so I said, all right, I'll throw my hand in the ring and show up for an interview. And then that afternoon, they said, the job is yours if you want it. But, but you weren't really involved in sustainability research no. before that, right? No. So what was it that made you, that, that, that compelled you so much about it? It was the concern as a citizen that uh, climate change is a real concern and my feeling that science and technology would have to be used to make better choices. And you're absolutely right. I did no energy research. I got there and I told colleagues and, you know, the directors of the laboratory, you know, the, and, and they said, well, Steve, we don't know that much about energy. I said, no problem, neither do I. <laughs> we are going to teach ourselves. And it actually started to work that way. We had retreats. We, a small group of us, a dozen of, half a dozen of us, met every Friday for two hours. And these were very, very successful, busy professors who were too busy to go to their own department meetings, but they would show up for two hours every Friday to talk about what we could do. And there was no guarantee of funding. But out of that, we got this BP grant for a half a billion dollars even though we didn't even know BP was thinking about it. Uh, and, and so we started to teach ourselves, and it, we got a, a, why did I care about it? Because this was a very good laboratory. Uh, 15, 14 people who worked in the laboratory got Nobel Prizes. But more important than that, over 30, 35 people who were trained there as young scientists, graduate students or postdocs, went on to get Nobel Prizes. This is a very good place. <laughs> I, when I was in the University of California, Berkeley, I was an employee of Berkeley Lab. Uh, Did and, you say, feel and Tom right? Check, you know, who, who got in you know, chemistry for you know, RNA enzymes, he, he was an employee of Berkeley Lab. Were you ever humbled by being around those people? There are 35 other people who <laughs> achieved somewhat the same as you, but uh, like, that amount I, of people? I don't know, not really. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, you know, it, when I was a graduate student, there were six active Nobel Prize winners in the physics department alone. Uh, in the years I was at Berkeley, uh, I think seven or eight of our, my fellow classmates also got Nobel Prizes. And I knew some of them, okay? And we weren't thinking about that. We're thinking it was a very exciting place to be. We, yes, did we know our fellow students were smart? Yes. <laughs> uh, and I used to tell people I was the second smartest person in uh, my class in physics. And how do you know this? Because the smartest person wanted to do his homework with me. <laughs> and he was definitely smarter than me. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, it was a very exciting time, and, and Nobel Prize doesn't mean you're smarter than the others. I mean, they're very good people who don't get Nobel Prizes. Uh, it was a very exciting time. It was very good professors, good students. Great. So you went, became a director of this Berkeley Laboratory without knowing any, anything about um, energy. energy. Then, five years later, you became Secretary of Energy without knowing anything about politics. 
I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that energy equals force times distance. <laughs> 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 Things like that. Yes, that's, and I didn't know. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about politics. Absolutely, never did anything in the political world. Never campaigned for anybody. Never, I didn't know the president, and I never campaigned for anyone uh, who was running for office. So why did you do it? Why did I do it? Yeah. Uh, I believed in the president-elect. Uh, I went and met with him. Uh, we talked privately for an hour in the middle of November after he won the election. I came back after that and told my wife, if this person asks me to become Secretary of Energy, I will do it. Uh, I would and other opportunities to work in the government, uh, I said no, because I, you know, I would Did like... Did you feel it was a better pl place to make an impact on... Yes, absolutely. Uh, there, instead of being a half a billion dollars a year, it was $26 billion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot more headache. Uh, lot, not all that was discretionary, but also in, because we were in this deep recession, uh, the Department of Energy got $34 billion discretionary money to be spent in two years uh, to help put the economy back up. But during that time, in the two years, the instructions were also to, to use that money to help position the United States in innovation so that future wealth could be created in the United States. And so that was, I was never, you can't imagine how intelligent and good looking and witty you are when you have $34 billion of discretionary <laughs> money. <laughs> it, <laughs> it also, <laughs> Never have I been that good looking. <laughs> it also made you the first scientist in a US cabinet. Um, what have you uh, learned about being a scientist in politics? Um, why is it important that there are scientists there? Well, it's important for many reasons. First, uh, there would be a number of people who still respected science. And they knew I wasn't, I didn't have political ambitions. Uh, and if they might have said, well, maybe he will grow them, uh, they were very convinced very soon thereafter that I had no political ambitions. I developed a reputation when senators or congressmen would call me up, they were as politicians, they want to bring federal dollars into their state, into their district. So they will tell you about all the good things they're doing and could you fund them. And in the last year, year and a half, uh, they knew, said, and they would say, they apologize. They said, well, my constituents have asked me to give you a call, so I'm doing this to tell you how good this project is. But I know you're, you're not going to act on this phone call. And he said, that's right. You talk, I listen. You can tell your constituents you talk to me. Uh, but I will not go around, turn around, and tell the people making the decisions uh, to give them guidance on how to make the decisions. I, the guidance was do your very best to fund the very best science and technology. That was it. And so I would protect those people from this political interference. And that's what I thought. I should do, uh, and that actually actually had some very, very good influences. Some person, uh, Professor Caltech said, I don't know what's happened, but in the solar program, you're all of a sudden funding the right stuff. And I said, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because when I was in, uh, before that, I could see what they're funding and said, no, why, why are you funding that? Industry's already doing that. Why are you funding this? Why aren't you funding something that could really be not just an incremental improvement to what industry was already doing, but fund some new bold stuff that could really change things? And, and, and so I called up and got some of my friends, some of the people who were highly recommended, and said, come and join me in the government. Says it's going to be lower pay, it's going to be long hours, but hey, we're here to save the world. And they bought it. <laughs> Half of them bought it. <laughs> uh, but, but many of them who would never dream of going in, into government, um, they would either take a leave of absence, sometimes they would have to quit their job. Uh, six members in the National Academy of Sciences or Engineering, uh, oh, I was six, there were five others who joined. Several of them elected in their 40s uh, into a, 
an org you know, honorific organizations, you're were, you were usually electing your 50s or 60s, but they were still in their 40s. So can you imagine you've been elected at age 42, 43, you're 44, you're in National Academy already, your career is going like this, why would you ever go and work in the government for less pay and abuse? And you, some, often they had to leave their families behind because their families were in school. So they, and the government would not pay for them to commute. Okay? They had to do that on their own nickel. And so they were willing to do it. And if you get really good people like that, and I, then I would protect them from interference and bureaucracy and say, do your job, you know, and I will protect you. And, and, that is, and that's what you need in these positions. Someone who can stand up and protect people and, and, uh, and get good people. So it worked. You were also the, with four years, the longest serving uh, Secretary of Energy ever. Yes. Um, you already mentioned that um, the current president has um, decreased the budgets to... Well, he's uh, asking to decrease the budgets. Asking to decrease <laughs> the budgets to zero. Um, what do you think are long-term contributions you made to, um, to the sector? Uh, well, one of them I already talked about, and that is uh, investing in wind and solar is now a good financial investment. Okay. The secret's out of the bag now. Okay, banks convinced it's good, you can make good money. Uh, we did push a lot of technologies very far. Uh, some of them are working their way, you know, this, especially this RBE vested. We put a lot of money into, well, we look for white spaces. I'll give you a, a detailed example. A white spaces where industry was not investing heavily. Uh, but you knew it needed something. An example would be in high voltage electronics for transmission distribution lines and high voltage DC. Uh, so we invested in research in material science in silicon carbide in gallium uh, nitride. Uh, so you can build higher quality crystals so you can make high voltage, high power transistors that could be much more efficient. Uh, if you're a company, uh, Siemens or someone like the ABB, you're not going to invest in material science, gallium nitride, silicon carbide. You know, they will use those technologies. So in the material science to make better materials, we said this is an appropriate form of U.S. investment. And they were making better materials, and now you can get megawatt transistors uh, you know, 10, 10 kilovolt transistors, a single transistor, and megawatt power, uh, the size of your thumb. Um, and so th there were numerous things like that where it, it's more basic stuff in the sense that, yes, it's engineering and applied ma and materials and things, but again, industry would not invest in it. They would use it, but they won't invest in it. Um, we look for ways of capturing carbon dioxide. We look for things like that. We look for all sorts of other things that um, will have lasting impact. I was hoping RPE would have lasting impact, uh, but um, so do you it's think become that, a political football. Do you think that if the government doesn't continue this uh, research or investing, do you think Wall Street will take over? Well, I, no, I think uh, other countries will invest. Uh, um, China was very happy we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where it was a trade agreement that was actually was very heavy-handed in favor of the United States. Uh, China was not part of it, and we walked out of it, and China said, oh, that's good. <laughs> and so, so I think other countries are, you know, my... My friends in Germany, for example, are saying, we're getting better at graduate applicants now. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, uh, because people are beginning to see the United States perhaps as not open and inviting as it was two years ago. Uh, uh, in terms of the innovation things, I think other, other countries are saying, you know, if the United States wants to surrender technical leadership, you know, it may be good for us. Uh, it's, it's bad for the world, believe me. <laughs> uh, you, but but uh, I just hope somehow the United States wakes up to this. Because this is about, you know, forget even whether you 
believe in climate change, or maybe if you don't want to spend one penny uh, on doing anything about it, it, this is actually in self-economic interest. This is, this is you know, what made America rich in you know, computers, electronics, you know, all these things. Are okay. you uh, hopeful for the future? Uh, Got to be hopeful. Okay. Well, on that note, I think we have to leave it to the audience. Um, because otherwise we take way too, much, way too much time, and I think there are many questions in the audience. So um, if you have any questions uh, about climate change or about any other uh, uh, topic that relates to Professor Chu, then uh, please raise your hand. And, uh, This was briefly touched upon in the previous question session as well, but I think it ties in nicely to the to the end of this discussion. So, um, just hold yeah. pull it up here. Okay. Um, so you already talked about uh, Shell and uh, sort of the future of the oil companies, but uh, it seems that up until now, at least, most of the investments that they are making. Um, do not really make economic sense if uh, the energy transition will go as quickly as it should if we want to stick to the two degrees. Uh, Could you cut to your question? Or, because I think there would be many more. Yeah. Um, so, so do you feel like the oil companies realize um, the economic importance of... And also, it seems that they are sort of betting with all of their influence and money on a slow transition, slower than we need to. So how I, do you I feel think it varies in? between oil company and oil company. Um, uh, the American oil companies are the ones who are the most, and the national oil companies of various countries uh, drag their feet uh, a lot. Uh, Shell, yes, Shell is not moving as fast as it could. Um, uh, no oil company is quote moving as fast as it could, but in part because of of this these financial concerns. Um, you know, last several years in the oil and gas industry were very bad because the technology got so good, especially with horizontal drilling and fracturing, hydraulic fracturing. The price goes from $100 to $40, and now it's $45, something like that. And so, bad habits. Um, uh, of being wasteful uh, got established, but uh, it does have some hardship on these companies, and they're struggling. Before, I don't know, uh, uh, ExxonMobil used to make uh, $40 billion a year profit. That's a lot of money. Uh, and so their profits has, have gone down. Now, um, I'm, you know, the reason I'm willing to be on this science council, or constantly debate uh, whether it is, is to help them make a transition, to help them identify clean industries that they can take a leadership role and be profitable and and do these things. Uh, so, so I don't mind doing that. Uh, it's, you know, they don't pay very much, and I can. Um, not really interested in making the money, but but it, it, to the extent that I can help, I'm willing to do that. It's it feels in many ways much more constructive than trying to uh, have discussions with people in Congress who whose election campaign is being supported by fossil fuel industry in the United States, and the, you know they they are given what they should talk about and what they should vote on. So at least in Shell, there's a chance. But you know to. But yes, to help them go faster. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, so I'm understanding that we are in an energy revolution moment, and uh, I think that it. Um, um, do you think that it's possible that this uh, it's enough if it's not? Um, 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 a, a, a wheat, uh, even an agricultural revolution. Because uh, energy, it's enough, but, it, uh, but it's not actually enough for everybody. Because uh, I think that it's uh, like even the water pollution, it's a massive problem. And so your question is, is the energy revolution enough, or should there no. be also revolution very, in other Very fields? good point. Uh, I think 
there, there has to be another agricultural revolution. Uh, also, the amount of greenhouse gases given off in agriculture, land use, grazing, is equal to the amount of greenhouse gases given off in electricity generation. Agriculture and electricity are about the same in terms of greenhouse gases. There are many farm, farming practices that could be adopted that, that won't cost anything more, but you have to get it out to the farmers to say, you know, low tillage, good farming practices that can greatly decrease. It's just like re reforestation. Now, stop deforestation, start to plant trees, that's also very helpful. Many, many good ideas and technologies to put carbon back in the soil. Uh, for all the years of agriculture being uh, practiced, carbon has been, there's a lot of carbon in the soil, inorganic carbon, and the, and, and the nutrients of the soil have been depleted, not all of it being replaced by chemical fertilizers. Uh, so there is a big opportunity in science uh, to actually, uh, we're beginning to understand the microbial things around the roots of the plants, the rhizomes, and the imes. Uh, we knew there were thousands and tens of thousands. We couldn't culture them. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't study them. And only in the last five years, we're beginning to learn how to study them. It's that interaction. It's like the uh, all the little critters in your gut. There are more foreign cells in your body than there are human cells. Most of them are in your intestine, just in sheer number of cells, bacteria and other cells, okay? The interaction of those microbes in your body with you are more profound than we ever thought possible. It's just not digestion. It's your immune system is very intimately tied to what those microbes are doing. Your cognitive ability seems to be tied to what those microbes are doing. You're, it's a, it's, a, you know, how could, you know, this is crazy. How could your cognitive ability be tied to all the bacteria that we thought were the only there to help us digest food? Uh, the similar realization is growing in the microbial stuff. And so you, you want to grow more food, more nutritious food, with less herbicides, pesticides, you know, the fertilizer is a large reason there's so much greenhouse gases, but if you over fertilize, the plants don't use it anymore and N2O goes in the atmosphere. If you under fertilize, the plants like it, but if you, and we over fertilize. So there are many, many things, there are several revolutions. The water management is another very important thing. So water, agriculture, energy, it all is one big problem. If you have cheap, clean energy, you can get water. You can pump water, you can purify water, you can desalinate water. Uh, but, it, but you have to do all these things. And so I could talk for many hours on, on all these scientific opportunities in agriculture as well and in water management. So it's, it's all, okay. Just a quick answer. What's your vision on use of hydrogen as an energy carrier? It's possible. It's, it, it, um, it's not only possible, it really depends on um, if you can make it cheaply. It's now made by from natural gas and reforming natural gas. So in terms of CO2, it doesn't help if you use natural gas, methane. Uh, if you use renewable energy to make hydrogen, it's a very different story. If electricity gets to be two or three cents a kilowatt hour, that becomes very real. And we just heard in a presentation, there's a, a group in Germany that has found out how to put hydrogen in a liquid chemical form where the density of storage uh, is, you know, in the ballpark of uh, liquid natu liquefied natural gas, not as high as crude oil, but good enough that you can put it on a ship and ship it. And that's very exciting because you can go to where renewables are very cheap and abundant with lots of solar and wind, make hydrogen, put it in this chemical form on a tanker, uh, and you can ship it around the world. You, it costs about two cents a gallon to ship crude oil anywhere around the world. Two cents. That's the best long-distance transmission line you can possibly imagine. 
to ship and pump out. Pump on, ship, pump out. And so if you can do the same of getting sun to hydrogen, hydrogen to a liquid chemical form, ship it, convert it back, uh, that becomes very, very important because then you also can go to where the uh, renewable energy is very cheap and ship it around the world like you do oil. Uh, now, so we just heard this report. I had not heard about it before while we were going into this. I was Googling all the references. I'm going to contact this person. And I said, this is one of the most exciting things. In the summary, I said, this is very exciting because if you can ship hydrogen like that, you know, they were also thinking, oh, you can put it in a car and, or a truck, uh, and, but then you'd have to then take that, the chemical out and put in another thing. And, you know, but, but just put it in a tanker, ship it, and then you can have a local pipeline in a city. You start with delivery trucks, buses, you know, things like that, where central fueling stations, and then you can have a partial hydrogen economy. Okay, electric vehicles for personal transportation, but for heavy use trucks, have you used things where you need to fuel in five minutes for not 150 miles, but 500 miles? Have, long the whole truck in the United States, they're driven 100 to 150,000 miles a year. One truck. And you, you, you know, when you're putting fuel into the truck, the amount of energy you're putting in is about five megawatts of energy going through that fuel line. Uh, you can't do five megawatts of energy. The connector will be this big. The, it's this, you know, it's, uh, so, but hydrogen, you can do it that fast. So, so it has a real possibility. I, uh, and again, I hadn't, you know, I was a little skeptical about hydrogen until I found that there's this technology and now I'm, now turn around, I'm very excited about it. Now, I think batteries plus hydrogen will be good for transportation. All right. I think we're, yeah, I think we're a little bit short on time. Um, Maybe we can allow you to ask well, a question since you actually wanted to get the microphone and then Peter asks his question. Okay. <laughs> Maybe one last question? Yeah, one last question. Okay, so maybe, um, Gertine, if you ask a question, and then Professor Chu answers shortly, and then if there's okay. one more person who has one question, and who says, okay, I uh, can't sleep for the next two weeks if I don't ask this question to Professor Chu. And, and I will time myself. I'll try to keep it on one minute. Okay. And then I think we have to uh, call it a day. Um, so please. Okay, so you said that uh, basically as a Secretary of State, you were able to get so much accomplished because you were very uh, unpolitical. Now, most of us scientists don't want to get, uh, become politicians, so what as scientists being doubted by the general audience also? What should we do as scientists to make much more possible with the knowledge that we accomplish? I think you start by talking to colleagues who, it, you know, if you're a scientist, you, you can understand things better. You just talk about the things. So talk about what science is, what's not. Uh, you, things that influence people's lives, like the risks of climate change, you can talk about. Uh, and that will actually have an informed public. Uh, I share, you know, I did not want to work in the government. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was willing to. Uh, but I think uh, the general public has to, the more the general public understands what is happening, what's at stake, and what's true, and what's fiction, is very important. So they were, 45 minutes, seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so who has this, this one golden question? Okay, so I see one arm. So first of all, um, I was very inspired by your talk, uh, but you also talked about a uh, worried citizen. And uh, now my question is, what would you think as any worried citizen in this uh, audience what can we do what's the one thing or what are the things we can do uh, I would say look at your lifestyles okay now this is Netherlands this is Amsterdam um, so riding a bike is much more efficient than driving a car uh, but but think about how you consume energy I did not talk about energy efficiency but energy efficiency uh, and not squandering energy is half the problem 
And so live your life in that way. When you boil water, put a lid on the pot. It will use far less energy. Learn how to boil spaghetti with the lid a little crack so it doesn't, the water doesn't go on the stove. But you're, um, uh, you know, if you're so inclined, you can think about eating a little less meat. Okay, because if, especially beef in terms of land use, 10 times the amount of land as, as growing vegetables, and quite candidly, vegetables uh, are, and greens and all these other things are better for you. And so, uh, that's, but that's a personal choice. You know, if you like meat, you know, maybe small, smaller portions. Uh, and then talking to your friends and family about this, because, because, um, you know, energy at home. There's so many things you can do to decrease the energy loads uh, that are common sense things. I mean, Department of Energy has websites on how to do those things. So, so let your, the way you live your life be a good example, uh, and you contribute in a large way because energy consumption is half the problem. And what if you would want to do a little bit more? Sorry. Okay. What if you would want to do a little bit more? A little bit more. Um, then I would say. Then I would say. Think of. You know what scientists can do. It depends on what the uh, Netherlands government is. Uh, there are many places where you don't have to be a politician, but you can be staff people, uh, staffing it. So not to run for election, but to give, to be the expert there to give advice. Uh, they're senior scientists, sometimes not infrequently asked to give advice, the scientific studies problems. Also, young idealistic scientists will go and work in Congress as staffers for people in Congress, because the Congress people don't know science and they, and they, and they need something. And so if you get very smart people to do that, it's actually very helpful. It's necessary. And so that's, I have a lot of young people willing to, you know, spend a few years just saying, you know, delay their career, you know, you're, you're marginally paid, uh, but it, it is very useful. And I'm sure in the Netherlands, it must be something similar to that, but many staff positions uh, use young people to gather up the information. And, and some of it, a lot of it is non-political, or at least you give the congressman or the senator or the agency, and it's also in agencies, uh, that, that information. Uh, because a, a, a responsible government agency wants to make informed choices. Okay, and so that's another thing that that many people do do. I was very selfish. I, I was when I was younger, <laughs> and and concentrated on science. But I've learned, you know, I, I you know when asked to give, advise the government, I would do that, and studies. But uh, and so I would continue to do that. Um, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you for your, uh, for your great talk, your kind answers. Thank you for all the questions. And then let's thank Professor Chu again. <laughs>